is now like one of the not only leading in innovation but the way the world is very interesting. Um, I found out like that that idea that innovation is, is can you explain a bit more about idea of technology? Sure. So sandbox is a simple idea that within an area like one of Taiwan's remote islands, like the Orchid Island, the Green Island, and so on, people can try out new innovations like telemedicine, where a local nurse, a local clinic, can nevertheless diagnose and perform specialized doctor tasks, supervised by a doctor in the main Taiwan Island, mediated by telecommunication. And so this is usually against the law. But some innovators think, oh, this is actually a really good solution to the problem of the lack of specialized doctors in the remote places. So they apply for a testing for three months up to a year. So say after three months, they test this model, and the Ministry of Health and Welfare participates as a co-governor, making sure that they are not uh, putting their patient's life at risk. So after three months, people think, oh, it's actually a better idea. So we can go back and change the law and regulation to make sure that this innovation becomes the new norm in the regulation. So for a limited time, in a limited space, just show everybody it's a good idea or a bad idea. That's the idea of sandbox. So the sandbox is started from like you want to employ it or actually the or what you call the, the social innovators, oh, right. the people who innovate uh, with participation from the society to solve a social problem. And, and, and for the start, the common problem was a real issue. Yes, so from the very start, the common problem were uh, usually around uh, medical or around transportation. These are the three main things. Because medical practitioners and transport practitioners need a license to operate. But once you are a licensed operator, your incentive to innovate uh, very strongly kind of diminish a little bit. And if a new team comes up, trying to disrupt this, they will face a lot of uh, pushback from the original licensed operators. So it helps to have a smaller testing place for everybody to see if you introduce this innovation, it's not only good for the society, but also good for the existing established players that they can work time and time with the startups. And without this kind of small testing pilot side, people will just be pushing each other. Oh, so it like, like, you know, put everyone and work together instead of disrupt each other. Right, exactly, because many laws and regulations didn't anticipate self-driving vehicles, because these weren't around when the laws were written. When the laws were written, people didn't anticipate that now you can use uh, telecommunication to do surgery, like the Da Vinci machines, right? So the law lawyers at the time, the lawmakers, did not think something like that would happen. So of course they did not write in provisions to regulate that. But once these emerging technologies happen, like e scooter is a very good example, instead of just challenging the law to change for the entire country, maybe for the group, maybe not for the group, it will be for the lawmakers and regulators that did not have any first-time experience. So they are forced to make changes without any experience on this new thing. Because that makes them criminal, right? They want to try this. Right, so we have a sandbox where after three months, after a year or two years, uh, that all the lawmakers, all the regulators, and their constituents have a chance to try those self-driving vehicles, those emerging technologies. Then we can calculate what people feel like, uh, whether it's a good idea or not. If it's a bad idea, we thank the investors, they pay the tuition for everybody, we all learn something. Uh, but if it's a good idea, then we can change the regulation in a way that reflects the social norm. You don't need to change the whole law. Exactly. You just change the part that people have already put in the three months or a year or so. That is a good idea, a good angle for the society. Is there any doubt when you first like, you know, you make a good idea? Yes, of course. There's fear, there's uncertainty, there's doubt. And the good thing about Sandbox is that we don't have to let those fear a certain and they'll stop the, the experiment. We can turn those into the questions that the experiments try to answer. So it's just like any research, except it's taking place in the social setting. So it's open data. It's yeah. an open data. Everybody needs to disclose 
the privacy protection plan, the consumer rights protection plan, and so on and so forth uh, in their operation. So even if they fail, they fail publicly, so everybody can learn from it. Give me one good example that is coming out from the sandbox. Well, I talked about telemedicine already. <laughs> so now in all the 105 uh, remote islands, as well as the indigenous nations, uh, they all are now equipped with the hardware and the communication facility for the local nurses to connect to the large hospitals doctors and become a team and do diagnosis together. And this has massively increased the trust of local people to their local clinic. Otherwise, they always think, oh, we need to summon a helicopter to take my uh, family to a large hospital to get the best treatment. But now the best treatment can come to them instead of flying the patients uh, to their larger hospitals. I think this is a really good innovation, and it has been uh, rolled out to all the 105 places because in Taiwan, broadband is a human right. Anywhere in Taiwan, you're guaranteed to have 10 megabits per second. It could be on the top of the Yushan Mountain, in the southmost Pacific Island, you're all guaranteed to have broadband access. You were saying that, like I saw an article, you were saying that uh, this is the best way to encourage people to come up with like an uh, innovation or innovative idea because a lot of people want to start something new, has a pain point. They were scared, they were uh, didn't have any resources. Mm -hmm. Do you think this is like the way the government goal should be in order to encourage people to be innovative? Yes, I think the main idea here is open innovation. So there are, after the telemedicine, uh, also uh, some um, counselors, uh, therapists, uh, who work with uh, people to improve their uh, psychological health, not their physical health, also want to provide their counseling over the internet. And so they also started a sandbox experiment, trying to see whether it makes sense for the people who maybe are depressed, maybe they are anxious, they don't want to step out of their house. And still, I think counseling uh, really helps them. But if they cannot walk out into the clinic to meet with the therapists, uh, their condition cannot be improved from the first stage. So if they have already built some trust with a clinic, for example, and if they are not feeling very well, then maybe they can still use telecommunication to talk to their therapist. And the therapist can still charge uh, them exactly as if they have uh, worked face to face. And currently, there's no regulation for this uh, practitioner. So, again, as we speak, a new experiment in the sandbox is going on to show what is the uh, minimum requirement, like the cell must work really well, or the uh, screen must be very clear, or things like that for a therapy to really happen. And so once we determine that, and the privacy protection, the fiduciary duty, who keeping duty, and so on, all this after the sandbox, we will have a much more clear idea, and then we can change the regulation. So the government, instead of saying we're uh, mediating the fight between uh, the innovation on one side and social justice on the other, uh, we can have these two kind of people work together in a sandbox and figure out something that they have common values with, even though that they have different positions. And then the government can work on the common body. So innovation doesn't have to be driven by money or by high you know, uh, profit, but it should serve the purpose of the society and common uh, value of the people. Right, if you seek long-term profit, usually it aligns really well with the social and environmental benefits. But if you seek only one quarter profit, then those disruptions may earn some money on the next quarter, but it caused the social backlash and the social sanction will happen because in Taiwan there's very frequent social sanctions. Uh, once that happens, then the business goes out of business. And so trying to earn quick money doesn't align well with the social environmental benefit. What the sandbox is trying to do is to have everybody have one year so that your return of profit takes place after this one year of trying out with the society. But in return, we're giving you a exemption. Everybody else is still illegal, right? You're the only one who can legally operate. So you have a first mover advantage for one year or so. So if it works well uh, and the uh, legislation wants to make a law, they can continue making the law. But your business still operates. And everybody else is still illegal. 
So this is also a profit uh, motive for the innovators to participate in the sandbox uh, because they have a limited time monopoly. Right. But uh, in usual term, they must participate in open innovation. If they fail, they fail. Okay. And great idea. you also focusing on the way into this? Why is that? Yes. In Taiwan, what we are witnessing is that we have a lot of very good fuel for wind power, especially offshore. And the renewable energy in Taiwan is important because people care about the carbon footprint and people care about the air quality. And a lot of these uh, innovations start with people just being more conscious of their contribution to the energy use. So there's also a lot of uh, people who just choose the uh, like students uh, who don't cause air pollution because they're doing it. Uh, but also that can participate in the battery swap uh, stations that uh, will act, indeed become a kind of energy store so that we, on the peak hours uh, when the renewable energy are not yet caught up on the demand, uh, it can free up energy from those uh, energy stations. And uh, on the down hours, then it can uh, recharge from the surplus energy generated by wind power. Are you talking about Kongoro? Kongoro is one example. Yes, they are a energy uh, grid delivery uh, company. But there are also many like indigenous tribes uh, also working for their own energy sustainability so that when typhoon or earthquake comes, they are still energy uh, sufficient. They don't have to connect to the main grid. They can still support their communication and their livelihood even if they're cut from the main electricity grid uh, for the repair to come. And so self-sufficiency, resilience, and uh, as we mentioned, Kogoro, the environmental responsibility, I think these are the driving reasons why a lot of talents, young talents, just participate in the energy work. And Kogoro was one of the sandbox uh, initiatives. Kogoro is legal. Kogoro is totally legal. So they but don't, they were they not don't part design. of the, were they part of the sandbox? No, 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 because Kokoro started uh, manufacturing the scooters uh, that already passed the scooter certification. Yeah. So they don't need a sandbox. They're, they're just a, a commercial participant. But they said that they're a business with a social purpose because they want to reduce pollution and they want to increase energy efficiency and resilience. In case of Kokoro, yes. how your uh, role and development are supporting Yes, I think Kokoro, uh, what they mainly is uh, a promise or a guarantee from the government that renewable energy and uh, pollution-free transport, electric vehicles, is the general direction. If we're saying that, oh, we're keeping those uh, official cars uh, and motorcycles or burning uh, fuel um, uh, indefinitely, then of course it's a wrong signal to the society. So we have to start on ourselves. So we start by saying our core processes our uh, own official cars and things like that, which are nowadays uh, somewhat hybrid cars, as we use on the increase, we say that uh, we must gradually shift all the cars that are supported by the taxpayer money into electric vehicles and uh, eventually self-driving vehicles. And so when, when this happens, it sends a signal to the society that where the world is going is where Taiwan is going. And so that really helps to align their marketing and their sales uh, um, uh, campaigns. What are the challenges to take Taiwan into a real digital era, for example, 5G and um, smart society? From the beginning, we have also the digital or the electronic version, and we are going to the next revolution. What are those challenges? Yeah, I think the main challenge now is that whether AI is seen as a assistive intelligence where every school children can work with. Not a trick. Not what? Not a trick. Not a trick. Not a trick. Not as a trick. Right. It's not a threat to not seen as a threat. That's right, that's right, yes. So the, I think the main point here is now AI if it's democratized. Like everybody learns how to work with AI, how to make AI that are assist our daily life then that is a good scenario. But if AI is over-concentrated into just a few suppliers that people can no longer change, then that is the bad outcome. I will use one example. Uh, in many uh, Taiwanese, including me, uh, who were um, 
growing up in the 80s and the 90s, Taiwan is seen as the main place for personal computers. And personal means that we can change it however we want. So if I want to install uh, Lotus 1, 2, 3 uh, to work on my uh, spreadsheet, I can do so. But if I want to play games all day, I can also do so. Right? So personal computer means that whatever runs on the computer can be cho chosen, can be changed by the user themselves. Right. They're empowered. But if uh, there's no personal computer, what people had before personal computer was terminals. So they are just screen and keyboard. But all the programs, they cannot install new programs. These are all managed by the mainframe, by the large computer. Right? So it was not called cloud at that point. It's uh, centralized. But it's, it's right? centralized. Yeah. Right. So citizen development, I think that is the main uh, thing that is driven Taiwan's AI. For many Taiwanese uh, primary schoolers, uh, they have in their environment class uh, an AI uh, data gathering device called the Airbox that just measure the air quality around the school and send it into a distributed ledger or a blockchain that uh, teaches the children what it does it mean to be a data steward, what does it mean to take care of your data, to contribute your data, what does it mean to form a data collaborative, and it's all in the social sector. And the government is not imposing anything on those airboxes. Instead, we're supporting them. When they say, oh, we have more than 2,000 measurement stations, uh, we're rolling uh, more than 10,000, but we want uh, some in the industrial park. But the industrial parks are private property, so the school children cannot go and install airboxes on there. But it turns out the government owned the land in the industrial park. Okay. So we just took their airbox design and put those uh, detectors on the industrial park. And so the government complements the social sector as well. And the social sector is led by teachers and researchers. And in this shape, the data governance, the AI that's trained from this shape, is governed by the citizen along with the business and the government. So people won't feel that it's all decided by a central computer. And the innovation would work and serve the people if it's only a democracy. Exactly. I think the idea is a democratic governance where the innovation is not just for the people, but with the people. With the people is the most important part. That's interesting. When you talk about AI democratized, it means like... like I, I mean, everybody can have a say in the governance of AI systems, just like the internet. Anyone with an email can participate in the governance of the internet through the Internet Society, through the Internet Governance Forum. You don't have to be an elected uh, representative. Anyone can write a uh, proposal to a working group and join the Internet Governance. So it is democratic, but it is not voting. It is uh, a participatory democracy. So without the transparency and democracy in the government or in the country, you can't achieve that? Well, you can uh, facilitate social innovation. So even if the government is not being voted in, still the government can use participatory budgeting, uh, can use petitioning, uh, or a sandbox list as another very good example. So it doesn't quite matter whether the ministers are appointed, as I am, or they are elected, like in the parliamentary systems. As long as the minister can say, people can, can have ideas. If they don't work, uh, I can take some risk. If they work, I am invested to support but not control the civic innovations. As long as the ministers have this kind of promise, we can facilitate social innovation. And this is not the same as uh, voting, uh, as democratic to see by voting. Where did you see this example? From what country is already operating like what Taiwan is doing? Yeah. So uh, many people uh, started looking into Taiwan and found that we have a lot of innovations, but we didn't invent the most of it. So in our uh, sandboxes, actually it starts from the UK, and then Singapore adopted it for the FinTech. Because Singapore is very strong in finance, and their regulator know that we have to have first-hand experience uh, as the finance uh, service grows to develop regulation technology. So the FinTech sandbox is first 
started in Singapore, and we followed about a year after Singapore. But the only change is that we make it general purpose. It's also self-driving vehicle, it's also telemedicine, it's everything. Uh, it's not just for food tech. And so the main difference uh, from Singapore is that you can challenge in Taiwan any ministries, any regulation. Uh, well, other than money laundering and funding terrorism, those two are, are you know, you don't have to try these, so we know what will happen. But aside from those two, everything else is fair game. So it's much more broad than the Singaporean one. But Singapore is already doing very well, as the UK is doing well on the FinTech sandbox. And the e-petition system that I uh, mentioned briefly, uh, we learned from uh, Iceland, from the Recapi. They have a system called Better Recapi uh, that allows citizens to submit proposals. And they are also running really well. And uh, it was started by a party uh, called the, the Best Party. Uh, and so that party uh, initiated the citizen initiatives. And we just uh, adapted the idea into the Taiwan uh, petition system. Uh, and we also learned a lot from Madrid and also from Barcelona. Uh, when after the 15 m movement, they also started participatory budget efforts using the internet to get people and so on and so forth. There's a very large network of cities. Almost done. Uh, what is the most thing that is so hard to overcome to actually doing all this? I think it's the people's expectation. Um, if people expect the government to solve everything, then none of the sandbox will work because the uh, people will be waiting for the government to, to sign. Just like a uh, petition. If nobody submits a petition, the best petition system has nothing to do with it. Right? So the most uh, difficult thing for me is that the government must trust the people enough to have people propose ideas. There are some ideas in the beginning, like change Taiwan's time zone to plus nine. That sounds fantastic, and not in a good way, <laughs> like a fantasy. But if you ask very closely people who petition for changing the time zone to plus nine, and another 8,000 people uh, to propose that we stay in plus eight, you find they have common values, that they want Taiwan to be seen more unique in the world. It's just one chose a time zone as a solution. And after we invite both sides, like 16,000 people in total, all the people are uh, invited to join the face-to-face -face meeting. And the face-to-face -face meeting, uh, we said, oh, this is maybe not the best idea because um, it will actually not make Taiwan more unique in the world because you don't have to adjust the watches now. All the watch are auto-adjusted. So people wouldn't even be aware of it. So even the same budget, maybe we can do something more. And so people start brainstorming and say, yes, really using this budget, we should spread the word that Taiwan has marriage equality, that Taiwan has the best hospitality for expats, for people who want to live here. Uh, we have the best uh, idea of uh, speech freedom and human rights and democracy, uh, innovations and so on. And people agree whether they petition for this or that, that these are better than times on change to make Taiwan seen as unique in the world. And so everybody feels they have won after this kind of petition. But we have to first trust the people to propose these very strange ideas to still invite them in and have a real conversation with the public service. Taiwan in the next five or ten years, how is going to look like? So in the ten years, of course, we will achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, which is for the 2030, uh, and that makes uh, a transition or a transformation towards sustainability. Whereas before, the for-profit organizations are under the Ministry of Economy. The uh, for environmental uh, organizations are for the EPA and the Sustainability Council, and the pro-social changes, the charities and social entrepreneurs, and so on, were largely under the Ministry of Interior and Culture and so on. Nowadays, we're building a platform uh, for the Social Innovation Taiwan that connects all the twelve ministries together, so that we can discover the common points these three different groups of people are working on. This is called the triple bottom line. If we do anything, we want it to have a positive impact to the economy, to the society, and to the environment. So this realigning of the goals around the sustainable goals, I think is the main thing that will happen in Taiwan. And we're really already seeing a lot of fruit uh, in this trisectoral combination. 
many of the problems that cannot be solved by one sector alone uh, can be solved actually with coordinated action uh, by all the three sectors toward the shared sustainable goals. I think um, if you can look up at the presidential hackathon, many of the cases that won the presidential hackathon are the result of this kind of cross sector innovation. So technology cannot be excluded from society that's right. human value. That's right. Everything. That's right. Is, is, is right. So that's why I call AI assisted intelligence. It's a assistant. It's a assisting our intelligence. It is not changing the society to fit the role of the technologies. As technologies myself, my work is to listen to the people, develop technology that make people listen to each other better. And once we have some common ideas, some common understanding, then we can start innovations because those innovations will be solving a common problem. But if we just start solutions without identifying the problem, we end up causing more problems. Thank you. The first time I hear people talking about technology,